It's interesting how life can have such paradoxes that on one particular morning, life could be birthed and a new family comes together as a little girl's entering into the world. And at the same time, for another woman, her life is seemingly ending. This woman whose life was seemingly ending, she developed an issue. At first, she kept it quiet, and she didn't quite know what to do about it. But I imagine as her life continued to unfold, this issue began to take up more and more of herself. As she continued to live her life, at first, I imagine she talked to her mom or some close friends. How, how do I navigate this situation, this, this issue? And after the days turned to weeks without success, she began to turn to other means. She began to talk to doctors to try to find out what is going on with my body. How do I get made well? And they began to prescribe her different regiments and things to do to no avail. Well, the weeks turned to months. And now this issue began to dominate her body in a way that started to destroy not just her physical being, but her heart. Because for every day that this issue went on, it wasn't just a physical ailment, but her issue dealt with blood, which meant she was unclean in her community. She was cast off from society. In fact, she couldn't interact with people like she normally would, and so she was separated from them. Whenever she would walk into a crowded place, she would have to shout out, unclean, unclean, and people would fetter away lest they be touched by her. Well, as the years ticked over and over, her isolation from society, I can only imagine the pain that she felt from being alone in the midst of a crowd. The pain that she felt from not being able to love or to have human connection. We don't know much about her life, whether or not she was married, but if she was, it would have been grounds for divorce. We don't know if she had kids or not, but if she hadn't had kids previously, she would not have been able to with her condition. And so her life, her status, any potential hopes that she might have had as a little girl on who she was going to grow up to be increasingly fell apart as the broken pieces of her life continued on. I can even imagine after a decade passed, 11, 12 years passed, the prayer, maybe her prayer was, God, why don't you just take me now? What's the point of living if this is all life has for me? And then Jesus enters into the picture. Open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 5. We're going to have some fun. As you do that, there is an author, I'm sure you've heard of him in the least. His name is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. I have read most of his content, and I can confidently say to you that chapter 8 is his worst written chapter of all of his writings. Chapter 8 in the book of Miracles, if you've ever read it before, it is a very lengthy chapter, perhaps twice the length of most of the other chapters in that book, and it is filled with analogies and extra thoughts and just pontificating sentences that go on and on and on explaining this concept. And I remember we were dissecting this in class thinking, why is this so terribly written? It's Clive. He's fantastic. But what is going on here? And the more that we process through, the more that you can see, it's not written terribly because he's a bad writer. It's written because you could see his heart is all over this. You could see that this chapter, chapter 8, which dealt with the content of the incarnation, God with us, changed everything about his life. And so as he's trying to communicate to his reader, you and me, how important this is to his heart, he can only but help to explain and kind of exude as he pours himself out in this chapter. And so today in particular, I can identify with that because this message is not just a normal message for me. This changed everything. So I'm going to give you a little cheater heads up. What did Pastor Scott talk about today? What is the content? I will give it to you. Uh, The title of what we're going through is Placing a Demand on the Power of God. And how do you place a demand on the power of God? You resolve to see Jesus in difficult situations. You can leave now. You got the main crux of the message. Fantastic. Okay? So that's the word. How to place a demand on the power of God, how to resolve to see Jesus in difficult situations. But 
just like our friend Clive. There is so much in this because for the last decade, this passage and series of verses around it has transformed me in ways that I can struggle to articulate. In fact, out of all the literature in the Bible, second to like the cross and the resurrection, this has been the most profound piece of work that has impacted my life in a way that has transformed everything about the way I view myself and the way that I view Christ and interact with him. So, welcome to the journey of my heart as we dive into what Mark is trying to give us here in chapter 5. Verse 21, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, Remember Pastor Gary's message from last week. There is the man who was demonized, and Jesus was over at that side of the lake, which was not a Jewish area. So Jesus was coming back, and as soon as he gets to the other side, we have this story. A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, Jairus fell at Jesus' feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with Jairus. It's interesting. You're given a whole bunch of details in just a few words here. Jairus, a ruler in the synagogue, high in status in society. I can only imagine what was going through his head. For his daughter, we learned just a little later, was 12 years old, and she was dying. What would it have taken a man of esteem, a man who was a ruler of the temple, to lower himself down to talk to this Jesus character who we didn't know much about at the time? What would that have done to his status We don't know, but we do know that he was willing to risk it all for an encounter with Jesus. And yet another interesting thing is we have the juxtaposition, the highest in society against the lowest. Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, esteemed position. This woman, ostracized, unclean. And yet here, and in the beauty of Jesus, we find them face to face. Verse 25. There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus. Could you imagine 12 years living your life, unclean, unclean, ostracized from society? She wakes up just like every other morning, Hopeless, wondering why am I still alive? And yet the reports and the rumors start beginning to spread. Hey, it's that Jesus guy. The demon came out of someone. Like, you go to see Jesus, right? And so they start murmuring, right? It's a small little town, and so word travels quickly. That Jesus guy is here. That Jesus guy. And I can imagine what happened in her heart. And yet the great grief that happened, because have you ever been in a point of great grief and had a sense of hope only to be crushed by your perception of reality? Well, that, he might be able to heal others, but he could never even get close to a person like me. And so in her heart of turmoil, instead of staying in bed, she risks it all. You might have been at a point of desperation before, but when you are at true desperation, And there is such little hope to give. That step of faith usually is all you got. Because if you've been beaten down for 12 years to try one more time to open yourself up, that is a risk of one's heart. So she decides to see what this Jesus character is doing. Verse 27. She had heard reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Interesting. Touch his garments, I'll be made well. I was kind of pondering about this, thinking, why would that be a thing? Is there some, like, Jewish ritual that's going on of touching garments? What's going on here? So I dove into it. You're welcome. And we're going to talk about that. Got you, Ricky. Perfect. Uh, So, if we look in the Old Testament for Jewish culture, it was just, you know, the Testament. It's what they had. There is a book called Numbers. And Numbers gives a lot of rules and regulations as to how God wants to provide and protect his people. And in Numbers 15.38, it talks 
about their clothes. Specifically, when she refers to touching his clothes, she's referring to touching these tassels that were on the end of Jesus's prayer shawl. So as a religious leader, Jesus would walk around and the prayer shawl had four corners. And so there'd be tassels on this. Here's where that comes from. Numbers 15, 38. Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments. There you go. Throughout their generations and to put a port of blue on the tassel of each of their corner. Verse 40. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. Essentially, do this. It's a way of separating yourself so other people can see. You are a person of God and you're separating yourself for his purposes, the tassels. Now, in good old rabbinical tradition, they would look at various words and see when they would repeat in the scriptures because it would be a way of them understanding greater insight as to what God might be communicating to them. And so in Jewish tradition, the operative word in this verse was corners. I'll read it again. Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners. And so they begin to look of where else might corners be within our reverent scriptures for us to understand what God is doing. And oh, there it is to be found. Let me read a little bit further forward. Malachi 4 verse 2. Some of you guys are like, ah, Malachi, yes. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Your blank stares are exactly my blank stares when I was reading the commentary trying to understand this. I don't get it. We have to read it again. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. In English, we don't see it. But if you were to read the Hebrew you would see a word that would be the same. This word, wings, is the same Hebrew word that we get corners from. Let me give it a third time. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Jesus will rise with healing in his corners. Perhaps what this woman was recognizing is that this Jesus character wasn't like every other person. But this this Jesus character was the prophesied son of righteousness who is rising with healing in his corners. And so if she could just touch the corner of his garment, she would be made whole because this isn't just a random guy. This is the Messiah who has come to save us. What's fascinating is you and me, this makes sense, but remember in Mark, this was a unique revelation. If you go to Mark chapter 1, we as the reader are given that information. This is the account of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. So you know two pieces of information about Jesus. He's God and he's the Messiah, the one who's come to save. No one else has that information yet and they have to discover it along the way. And if you read the first five chapters of Mark, you see the people who begin to discover who Jesus is, it's not the normal people. It's not the disciples. Remember just a chapter earlier, there's the wind and the seas and Jesus calms them and they're like, who is this Jesus character who can control the wind and the seas? Who recognizes Jesus? The demons. Who recognizes Jesus? The marginalized and the leper. Who else recognizes Jesus? The lowest in society. Fascinating that the gospel has come not just for the elite, but for those who are in desperate need of his touch. Verse 29, so she touched him and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease immediately. Can you imagine that? She goes, 12 years is a long time. She touches the tassel in faith of who he is. And can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the freedom, the healing? For the first time in 12 years, her life is not just unclean, but she is now, the risk paid off. She went after Jesus. She placed a demand on his power and it changed her. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Oh, what a plot twist. Okay, let me break this down. So she goes, touches his garments, and remind you, she's unclean. So she's trying to be sneaky of like, 
okay, get in there, get out, move on with her life, done. Jesus then is like, oh, who touched me? I can imagine her facing away from him and just her heart going from this to sinking in the bottom of her stomach because here's what's at stake for her. She just walked into a crowd and didn't pronounce, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, like she was supposed to. She then touched a rabbi, which would have made him unclean. He was interacting with the Jewish leader, Jairus, would have made him unclean. Everyone in the crowd, unclean. The social consequences, let alone like the actual Levitical consequences in the law, would have been insurmountable. So for her to recognize, What is she going to do? And so in this moment of pondering, Jesus invites the question, who touched me? Now, it gets funnier. Well, we we actually have to hit one more thing before we get funny. Uh, Here's a little point I want you to see, that healing costs something. Jesus recognized that power went out from him. And I think that's an important thing to note, that to engage, to heal, to provide hope to people will cost you something. It costs Jesus something. Your salvation cost him his life. Nothing is free in that sense. There is a cost to everything. However, if we are to truly help one another, we must be ready to give of ourselves. We must be ready to do as Christ has done to lay down our lives. And that is a steep price. But it comes with an amazing invitation. You can exchange your life that's headed for eternal separation with God that is filled with hopelessness. You can exchange that for Jesus' hope, redemption, and wholeness. Yes, it comes at a price, but the reward is everything. Verse 31. Jesus says, who touched me? And his disciples said to him, you see a crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. If I was a betting man, I'd place a hundred bucks on Peter that it was him. What do you mean, Jesus, who touched you? There's all these people here. And I can imagine Jesus standing there and like, I'm not moving until it happens. And imagine Peter grabbing a sword like, everybody line up. We're going one by one, creating a scene. That's just me. So as this is happening though, I'm also imagining Jairus. Remember, his daughter is dying, right? Jesus is like, oh, someone touched me. And Jairus, I can just imagine, be like, bro. She's got minutes. Like, I came in desperation, and you're here wondering who touched you. There's hundreds of people around. Like, we don't have time for this. He doesn't say that. In fact, I just wonder what is in his head, because we have no record of him saying anything other than just standing there quietly. Have you ever been in a place where you desperately needed God, and yet what you received was silence and waiting? Perhaps... The interruptions in our lives are ministry moments that God is looking to captivate us with. So here's the moment of truth. Jesus looks around and the woman is trying to figure out whether or not she's going to lie to Jesus or come and confess. But I can only imagine as she processed through, she realized, I might be healed physically, but emotionally and mentally, I recognize that I've stolen something from my Messiah, my Jesus. And I don't know that I can live with myself and the guilt that I will carry. And perhaps that guilt and that feeling of guilt weighed more on her than how she even viewed her life, which is why she went up to accept her punishment. 33, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told Jesus the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, daughter. It's the only time Jesus ever refers to someone as daughter. And in that word, everything changes. What she was expecting was the full weight of heaven to come down and to chastise her and to throw her out and to give her the punishment she deserved. But instead what she received was the full weight of heaven coming and embracing her and correcting her incorrect identity. Her perception of being the woman with the issue of blood as her identity is not who Jesus saw her as. He saw her as daughter, my child. What also this did was for everyone else in the crowd who would have been upset for the fact that you, you exposed my kid. Now I'm unclean, now you're unclean. And the potential crowd that would have raged and attacked her, here's what Jesus says, she's mine. And because she's mine, hands off. In one word, 
Jesus took a woman who was broken and doomed for defeat and restored her to the highest of status in a way that protected her from any and everything. And so I imagine in that word, daughter, everything changed as she now had a realization that what she needed was more than just physical healing. She needed emotional healing. She needed mental healing. She needed a total transformation. And Jesus gave it to her. When it comes to placing a demand on the power of God, there is so much more than just the physical that we need. And I think Jesus realizes that. I think he knows that, which is why sometimes it might seem hard to find Jesus. And that's not because he's trying to play hide and seek and get your goat. What he's trying to do is help you be whole, not just in your soul, but mind, body, and flesh. And so the cost of following Jesus is great because the transformation he is trying to do is even greater. And so when you are in times of pain and despair, trying to hold on in that desperation, God, where are you? Why are you silent? Perhaps he is transforming more of you that you didn't realize needed his touch. You've heard it said that you got to get off milk. You got to get onto meat. You got to get that good stuff. Ah, oh, he's preaching really good. That was good meat today, guys, right? Yeah, well, oh, sorry. Anything that's processed through the digestive system of another, that's milk. So you might leave here thinking, oh, that was some really good content in that message today. Like, yeah, Jesus, it's great milk for you. Now, it was meat when I got it. Like, I did the work. I went through the last 10 years of my life and studying this and how that's transformed me. For you, it's a lovely sentence and it's a nice way to end your Sunday, but it is milk for you. And my encouragement here is that you don't just live life drinking milk from whatever preacher is on stage, but that you discover a passion to go get your own meat as you can be transformed by God because this might affect you here, but it is everything to me and this is why. When I was young and in high school and I was watching my parents slowly fade apart into divorce and I would hear them uh, yell and argue at night and it would be all I could do just to play the piano to block out their noise so I could find God. When I was desperate and in need of God's touch and it felt, he felt distant and I went into the Bible saying, God, where are you? And I couldn't find him. When I did the research of looking through how people would go through desert seasons in their life and weeks and weeks and months and years on end, it seemed like God was silent and I would ask, why God, why do you do this to people? And yet in the revelation of encountering God, of him filling me up, not in a place of worship, but in my quiet time at home when I'm on my knees at the edge of my rope trying to figure out, God, are you real? Or is this just a bunch of hoopla? It is in those moments where the power of God became real to me in such a way that I can never go back. But that was a lot of hard work. And then I realized what God was doing. It wasn't that he was holding himself from me. It was that he was purifying my heart. He was doing things. He was healing me. And I needed more than just the sensation of God. I needed the fullness of the Holy Spirit to transform me. You might be inspired from someone on this stage, but the real work, the real transformation, your relationship with Christ will be in your room between you and God. It'll be in the circles with your friends where you're expressing your doubt, your pain and frustration. It will be in those quiet places where you are raw and vulnerable. Don't get me wrong, this is great, we need this, but this is not enough for you to survive. But the greater invitation is this. It's not just about surviving. He has come that you may have life and life abundantly. If this is all of Jesus you ever experience, once a week you come, you sit in the pew, Branner's a great job, you leave, that's fantastic. But hey, there is so much more you can encounter. The God of the universe is waiting to transform and to heal and to bring life and to bring hope to the very depths of your core. And if you don't know what that's like, buckle up. It is a fantastic and amazing experience to have the God of the universe, our creator, completely transform and work in our hearts. And though it might feel terrifying to be vulnerable and go before God with our brokenness and our sin and our pain, how amazing it is to be greeted 
by one who will look at us and say, daughter, son, daughter. You have that promise, and we have that hope. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up. It was one night in particular, it was really tough. I was trying to process through my emotions and feeling separate from God and just feeling alone. And I remember in that moment, it just what I was doing wasn't enough. I was playing the piano. I was trying to drown out the noise. I was trying to get a connection. I was desperate. I had been pursuing God, but it seemed like it was going nowhere. And in that desperation, I felt like God spoke to my heart in a way that was more loud and yet silent than I'd ever experienced before. And it was an invitation to change my posture, to do something differently, to approach God in a different way because what I had been doing wasn't enough. I just, I just needed to do something physically different so that I could emotionally approach God differently because I was just hitting a wall that wasn't going anywhere. So I stopped playing the piano and I remember just sitting down. And in sitting, I turned on some worship music and a song came on, one that I hadn't heard before. And in the lyrics of the song, it invites you to change your posture and it gives a reference of how sometimes the closest we can be to God is when our knees hit the ground. That when our knees hit the ground in this position of surrender that we're able to touch the sky and encounter a different aspect of God that we might have not known before. And so in that place of surrender in that place of desperation the song played And as the words fell over me, it was like the Holy Spirit was inviting me to a new place of selflessness, a new place of letting go, a new place. One that I have to continue to discover, but it was the starting point of God changing me, a deeper part of me that I didn't realize needed to be changed. As we sing this song, I invite you to change your posture, whether that's standing or kneeling or turning around or doing something. But my hope for you is that you don't just leave coming to another Sunday church service, but you leave with the invitation of the Holy Spirit saying, I have more for you than you ever imagined. Let's do this together.